So today I want to talk about inner visuality. That's a term that may ring a bell. Some of you are probably more familiar with the similar term, intertextuality, which is a phenomenon by which we read certain texts that sort of stick with us in such a way that for the rest of our lives, any future text we read harkens back to that text. Intervisuality is the same process, only without the text. It's simply at work in the real world, in our day-to-day -day lives. So to make this obvious, let's take a look at a few quick examples. 420. There's a different meaning tied to these numbers in each of our minds. To some of us, it's just a laughable joke about marijuana. For others, it may remind us of a code we used to use in high school, which might then make us think about friends that we hung out with or memories of sneaking away to get high during class. 420 is an example of intervisuality, of an image, and in this case an idea, that bleeds off the screen and into our subconscious. The cross is another good example that may be a little easier to get a hold of. It certainly represents religion, and almost anyone will know that this is an emblem of a number of Christian denominations, but for those who grew up in a church, the image of a cross probably also brings to mind people, places, events, moral stances, services that we attended. And when we see other religious images, say a Star of David or a head covering, we think of them in relationship to our cross, the images that represented our religious identity. The golden arches in the red, white, and blue, how metaphoric is that? Right now, anywhere in the United States, and even beyond, you can go into a McDonald's and get a cheeseburger and french fries that taste exactly the same, or a Happy Meal, what a clever name, designed to keep kids associating McFlurries with happiness long after we're grown. That's deliberate, and it's genius. That means that whenever you're in an unfamiliar town, you can find a familiar space and know exactly what to expect. McDonald's. In the image of the golden arches, that big M, has become attached to these feelings of comfort. Mario, here at the bottom, is literally just a blob of pixelated images. And yet for many of us, this Mario represents our youth, or the glory days of gaming. And when we see him, we think about hours spent playing video games, the people we were sitting next to, the things that were going on in our lives at that time. In some ways, we are the stuff of these memories and these experiences. I want to digress here and introduce a term that we're going to use quite a bit in this class, dialectics, a way of examining ideas in relationship to their perceived opposites. When we use dialectical theory, we focus on things which are easily definable by their counterparts. Think of Republican and Democrat as just one easy example in the way that both of these identities are shaped and defined by what is usually considered to be the exact opposite. That doesn't mean they actually are the opposite, or even that they're stable. In fact, if you look closely at history, you'll notice that the back and forth tension of dialectics results in constant movement, including the ones we're undergoing right now politically. The Republican Party of today stands on a very different political platform than the Republican Party of 100 years ago, and in another 50 years, they'll be different yet again. So Plato is often given credit with coming up with this idea that art imitates life, because his are the oldest surviving writings to exist that talk about this. In his writings, he was basically saying that artists do not necessarily have to be very good at what they do. They don't have to represent the Eiffel Tower or the mountain sunset as realistic so much as they have to represent it as believable. And if the viewer of art hasn't seen an actual sunset or been to the actual Eiffel Tower, the artistic representation can easily fool us into believing things that aren't true. You might think the Eiffel Tower is much bigger than it actually is, for example, if the artist builds it out of scale. So Plato wasn't saying that all artists are bad artists, or that all consumers of art are dupes. He was just pointing out that the unavoidable problem of art is that it can fool those who enjoy it into believing things that aren't true without us even noticing it. Art imitates life. 2,500 years later, Oscar Wilde sort of flipped this on its head and said that life imitates art far more than art imitates life. You can probably think of times in your own life when you've seized upon something that you saw on a movie or on a television show or in an advertisement even, and then mimicked that behavior or that garment of clothing or that lifestyle choice or that hairstyle or that way of carrying yourself around the world. It could be a dip in the hip or a figure of speech. Anything you see on TV or read in a book or hear in a song can impress you in ways that cause you to emulate that behavior. Dialectical tensions, including the dialectical tension of life imitating art, imitating life, imitating art, and on and on, literally construct the reality that we live in. 
So right now we live in this Hollywood era where almost everything has been imitated over and over in television and in film. But we can go back and look at The Scream, a painting by an artist named Edvard Munich, painted 130 years ago. You probably recognize the original. But since it was painted, and especially since the meme culture of internet, this has been taken up and consumed and then recreated and then reconsumed and then recreated again. There's even a scene in Home Alone where Macaulay Culkin poses for the image at the bottom here, which was then taken up and pasted onto the original. You could think of this as life imitating art for the creation of yet more art. Dialectical theory gets pretty deep. You can do an internet search and literally find thousands of these paintings nowadays, and the dialectical tension between life and art is pretty obvious. I want to finish up today by turning back to the topic of inner visuality, and specifically how the images we consume come to inform our beliefs about the world we live in. I want to talk about drugs and how we learn to think about those who use them. In Western cultures, we've been offered a steady diet of the messages in front of you right now. Trump's first attorney general, Jefferson Sessions, repeatedly said publicly that good people don't smoke marijuana. We've been told that our brains are an egg in a frying pan, that if we use drugs, even once, we'll become addicted, that we should just say no, that drug users are dangerous and should be treated with tough love. These messages permeate our culture, but like Plato said, art imitates life. It isn't an exact copy, and sometimes it can be incredibly misleading. These are the images we've all been given about what drug users look like, this before and after picture, and we're supposed to assume a direct relationship between the drug use and the decline. We're supposed to believe that the people in these photographs had nothing bad going on, that everything was just fine in their lives until they picked up a substance, and that then, because of the substance and only because of the substance, everything changed. We're reminded, for the millionth time, that when you use drugs, even once, you'll turn into a sunken, hollowed-out image of yourself. But that isn't true. More than 75% of people who try even the most stigmatized drugs, like crack cocaine or methamphetamine, never struggle with addiction. The McDonald's arches can make your mouth water with an image of Happy Meals or French fries that pops into your head. 420 can make you snicker and chuckle because you think of old memories and good times. But that same media environment is also responsible for convincing us that drugs are dangerous and infectious, and that drug users should be tough-loved out of our lives. We don't usually get artistic images of successful drug users, like comedian Jim Jeffries or Bill Maher or Joe Rogan. The last presidents, except for Mr. Trump, have all openly discussed their drug use, which clearly didn't ruin their lives. Clinton smoked weed, and Bush and Obama both smoked weed and used cocaine. Of course these drugs don't necessarily ruin our lives, but since we don't have conversations about them, and we don't see success stories about people who use them in popular press, people that are already in a bad place and begin using drugs often wind up in a worse place because the rest of us turn our backs, we're afraid of them, and that's the result of the images we've consumed. So there are plenty of examples of inner visuality corrupting our thinking. Consider those that were close to you growing up. Do you live in a family where certain religious, racial, or class identities were stigmatized? Did you see representations that painted those outside of your immediate circle in ways that turned out to be exaggerated or even completely untrue? Think about how these theories play out in your life, in your individual memories, and how in turn they come to inform your reality.